Hello and welcome once again to my scientific channel, to my video lectures. Uh, this is the fifth uh, video lecture in the cycle dedicated to the students of economic policy in the major international relations and to the students of managerial economics in the major management. This time there is a novelty, well, sort of a novelty. In this video lecture, I am not using a PowerPoint. Uh, I will be using an officially published report, Fiscal Monitor, uh, published by the International Monetary Fund. And uh, in a moment, I will show you why I use this specific report. So now just a technicality. Usually when I uh, make a video lecture using a PowerPoint, uh, in the description box below the video, you have a link to the PowerPoint. Now uh, I will give you in the description box a link to the website of the International Monetary Fund for downloading this specific, uh, this specific edition of the Fiscal Monitor. And uh, maybe I should go there and just make it slightly smaller and show you what's the what's the general take uh, on that report. Uh, as you can see, there is a heading of the International Monetary Fund uh, at the top of the cover. Uh, now, just to explain you the context of this lecture, as for this specific report, the Fiscal Monitor, it is a, a report which the International Monetary Fund publishes normally twice a year. Usually uh, there is an edition in April and another one in October. This one is a little bit uh, in advance. It, is, uh, it was technically published in September because we have like an unusual year with the pandemic and uh, the economic recession. And this fiscal monitor is precisely dedicated to policies for the recovery. So to the central topic of which I recommend to you, my students, as the central topical line uh, of your graduation projects in those two courses, economic policy in the major international relations or managerial economics uh, in the major management. So. Uh, fiscal means uh, whatever governments can do with the money they collect in taxes on the one hand and the money they can borrow. Uh, sort of uh, additionally to this specific uh, to, to this specific video lecture, I have uh, written an update on my blog. Uh, the link to the update uh, will uh, uh, is to be found in the description box below the video as well. So you can sort of use both that video lecture on Fiscal Monitor and that written update on my blog, which is a little bit more about, uh, let's say, the technicalities of public debt and public borrowing. So let's go into that Fiscal Monitor. Let's uh, show you how you can use and how you can actively read with understanding such kind of reports. Let's start. I scroll through the table of contents through those first pages and I go directly to the first section that sort of really matters so to the executive summary. Here I will briefly go through some selected passages of uh, that executive summary mm, and my main goal here is to show you precisely how to read actively uh, such type of report, such type of content and on the other hand to give you already some, some lines, some hints as for what those uh, economic policies for recovery are and what they can possibly be in the near future. Uh, so, um, executive summary of chapter one, fiscal policies to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we read that 
The COVID-19 pandemic and associated lockdowns have prompted unprecedented fiscal actions that amounted to 11.7 trillions of dollars or close to 12% of global GDP as of September 11th, 2020. Half of the fiscal actions considered of additional spending or foregone revenue, including temporary tax cuts and the other half liquidity support, including loans, guarantees and capital injections by the public sector. Now I will uh, focus a little bit on that. Uh, it is important for you to understand that distinction. I will even magnify this specific paragraph So you have fiscal actions consisted of additional spending or foregone revenue, including temporary tax cuts, and the other half liquidity support, including loans, guarantees and capital injections by the public sector. Uh, this is essentially something that is a little bit new, that uh, way of looking at fiscal interventions has developed uh, or developed in simple past uh, in during the last financial crisis. Long story short, what the government can do with the money or with the cash flows they temporarily own are three things. First of all, the government can spend money directly on some actions vis-a-vis -vis the economy. So essentially the government can give some financial help, some subsidies uh, to individuals, uh, for example, with unemployment benefits or to businesses uh, to, you know, to help them stay financially solvable and financially liquid. So that's first thing. Now, the second thing, which is, uh, which is uh, sort of directly connected just by common sense, is that instead of giving someone cash, the government can just forego taking that cash from them. So the government can just forego collecting some taxes and therefore can leave some additional cash in businesses. And finally, the third thing that is named in this specific paragraph is liquidity support. Liquidity support means that the government acts as a facilitator of lending. Uh, I explain it more in detail in the written update, which I publish on my, on my blog. But essentially, um, when the government is fiscally active, when the government practices really active fiscal policies, the government can use the fact uh, that it can borrow money at much better conditions than most businesses can. Uh, so the government can essentially assure additional liquidity in the system by stepping into the system and by facilitating the process of lending from banks to companies. So we could say that uh, the government uh, is essentially a guarantor or even uh, di directly a provider of credit for companies. Uh, and now the general frame of it. There is a saying in finance that in the times of crisis, cash is king. And this is really the case to say it. Cash is king. Companies can survive the times of crisis. Companies can survive the times of recession or even a prolonged depression if they have reserves of cash to pay salaries, to pay the rents. That's the name of the game, at least on the short term, in such interventions by the government. So those economic policies sh should take care in the first time of keeping the economy financially liquid, financially solvable, so as not to allow any, uh, any like nefarious debt accumulating in any place in the economic system. Let's go further. Mm, 
I will make myself a little bit smaller. So the, this forceful response by governments has saved lives, supported vulnerable people and firms and mitigated the fallout on economic activity. However, the consequences of the crisis for public finances combined with the revenue loss from the output contraction have been massive. In 2020, government deficits are set to surge by an average of 9% of GDP, and global public debt is projected to approach 100% of GDP, a record high. Now, there is a thing which I explained in my previous video lecture, uh, where I sort of uh, put you on, on, on the track of fiscal policies in the context of technological change. Any government has something that we call a tax base. Uh, so all the people and all the businesses that can provide a tax revenue to the government. And now in the present situation, the government behaves uh, in a way like a, like a farmer. Uh, so they can see that their tax base now is shrinking. And uh, the question is, what do we do today in order to conserve our tax base for the future? So the government says essentially, OK, right now, anyway, the tax base is not really the best under the sun. So what we should do is to put money into conserving this tax base for the future. So into conserving the capacity of that tax base to yield a tax revenue in the future, like next year, in two years. That's something of a collective wisdom that we have acquired as a civilization since I see, I think, the Great Depression in the 1930s. Because until then, the common way of approaching the thing was that if there is a, an economic crisis, the government should rather step back, cut on spending, and just maintain its own capacity to work, and the economy will just sort of take care of itself. Now, policies are different, and it is assumed that governments can be like active economic actors and can sort of maintain the momentum of uh, their economies, just in order to have a better tax base, like in three years from now. So now let's quickly jump uh, to another side of, uh, of that page, to another passage, which uh, for, for the sake of presentational convenience I will highlight. Okay, so now I put it more in the center of our window. And I go to the bottom of the window to make the whole text more visible. So, with limited fiscal space, countries need to assess the benefits, costs and risks of support measures. Early insights suggest that public health policies that quickly contained the spread of the disease also allowed for an earlier and safer reopening, restoration of confidence and economic recovery, reducing overall social and fiscal costs. So here we have another example of, let's say, the unusual current context for fiscal policies. Because what this paragraph says is that, OK, guys, if you put more money into the healthcare system, uh, that healthcare system can help people push themselves through the pandemic, through the health crisis, and therefore we can maintain like a better condition, better overall operational condition of the economy. So what that paragraph states essentially is that when instead of stimulating sort of the whole economic system, we target that stimulation onto the healthcare system, then we can have like an extended result, an extended outcome. 
So there is like a facilitation for the whole economy to maintain its operational capacity. Now, a few, a few technicalities or a few vocabulary things which I will highlight and quickly discuss. First of all, wage subsidies. That's the first term that I want to, to explain here because it is like the vocabulary of fiscal policy. Second, tax deferrals and cuts. And finally, equity injections. So we have three terms, which I will explain like in the last part of that educational video of this video lecture. So wage subsidies. Wage subsidies are a situation when the government gives additional money either to the employed people directly or to companies that employ them in order to subsidize the salaries. The idea is that uh, we want not only maintain or prevent businesses from bankrupting, but we want to maintain employment. Here is like a broader context, mostly referring to the Keynesian school of economics. We know by experience that uh, when companies in the times of crisis start to uh, fire people massively, so when we have what we call massive job cuts, so when the unemployment rises, it is like a very, uh, very dangerous negative trigger uh, which could provoke a much deeper economic crisis. It is that principle that whatever happens, we should force ourselves to keep jobs intact. Those jobs can be maintained for some time, uh, for some time with a financial help from the government. So essentially with a financial help from other taxpayers or from lenders who lend to the government. But it's, it is important to keep those jobs in place. Whence the institution of wage subsidies. Now, the second one, tax deferrals and cuts. What the, the government can do with the taxes is to defer them for later, so to delay the necessity of paying those taxes or to cut those taxes completely, so to forego completely the given amount of taxes. Once again, it is that um, farmer mentality which uh, is the name of the game here. The government can assume that cutting completely a certain amount of taxes can be a good stimulation which will make those businesses more solvable and we, uh, in, in the future, so which will make those businesses a better tax base in the future. On the other hand, the government might be willing to maintain like a legal claim on that better legal on, on that better uh, tax base in the future by precisely using tax deferrals instead of complete tax cuts. So we could say that tax deferrals are like a softer fiscal tool and tax cuts are more radical. And finally, equity injections. Equity injections is, are something that is essentially new in fiscal policies. Uh, it was born like in the, during the last financial crisis in 2008-2009. It was born essentially in the United States under the name of quantitative easing. Uh, it means uh, that for some time the government buys or acquires a part of equity in strategically positioned companies in the economic system. Until the last financial crisis in most market economies, such a policy was unthinkable. Uh, people would call it nationalization or some would even call it communism. Yet the United States uh, sort of proved that the government can temporarily enter the equity of selected companies in order to stabilize them 
So the government for some time can be like an investor in those companies and then the government can back off. So it is something relatively new, which is being practiced today in the frame of those recovery programs. Okay, so this is all in that educational video. I hope I showed you uh, how you can look and read actively through those reports, which I recommend you to read, for example, the fiscal monitor. So the thing is, you read, you identify concepts, terms and expressions which either you don't understand or which seem somehow intriguing to you. And then you do your homework on those terms and expressions. Google them up, find them on Wikipedia or Investopedia or anywhere else, or, even, or, or you can even email to me or text me via Microsoft Teams um, as for the meaning of those expressions. And this is how you will develop a better understanding of what economic policies are. So that would be all in the video lecture. Thank you for your attention. Read the description box below the video. You will find useful links there. And for the time being, have fun with science and have fun with life. Bye.